Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to thank the Renewal Movement for this invitation to participate in our virtual series uh, for this week of renewal as we make our way to Pentecost Day. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I preach to you in the name of the triune God, the Father who creates, the Son who redeems, and the Holy Spirit who sustains. Amen. So I was given as my text, uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And it really, it made me smile because it is one of my favorite texts. Uh, it is the text where Paul, of course, says to the Romans uh, that he wants them to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. And this week, today, we are talking about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Paul, of course, is, is really uh, trying to take his hearers on a journey. He is trying to help them understand what it means to draw close to God. He's trying to help them and us, by extension, uh, come to a right relationship with God. And in that text, he, he makes his his claim as an appeal. He, he makes his appeal and he says to them uh, that he practically begs them, actually. He says to them, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this will, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Of course, we are in the midst of preparing for Pentecost, in the midst of preparing for the Advocate. We're preparing in many ways to hand our lives over to God afresh, to open ourselves up to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and to this notion that, that what we need, Jesus has already provided. That what we need to know God more closely and to walk in the paths that God sets before us has already been provided for us. Of course, Jesus tells his disciples that he will not leave them helpless, but he will provide the paraclete. And we are meant to participate in that, so that, that this process of preparing ourselves for Pentecost, preparing ourselves for the coming of the Holy Spirit, really ought to make us take on board what is the work of the Holy Spirit. And our theme, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, guides us to really ultimately uh, the real work that the Holy Spirit is involved with. The Holy Spirit helps us to be transformed by the power of God. The Holy Spirit guides us to the things that God wants for us and allows us to be able to discern where God is leading us, if we will allow it. And I deliberately say, if we will allow it, because I think that, that Paul himself uh, makes this case that it really rests with the believer to have the faith and to trust God in that way. Not that the believer has to do something for God to grant what God grants, but the believer has to believe, that's why we're talking about believers, the disciple has to believe that God has provided first Christ for salvation and then the Spirit to lead. And when we turn ourselves over to God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, then something happens to us that makes our lives different. So part of why I love to do these exercises, why I love to preach and to do the teaching preachments in particular, is because I always learn something new. Or I learn something that I knew a different way that helps me to be able to explain it better. And one of the sources that I went to uh, talks about Romans 12 being the fourth therefore. 
So I had not heard it described in that way. So I had to go back now and check what were the other therefores and, and why was that important. And um, I really was actually kind of happy with what I found. So I'll share it with you. Uh, and then we'll talk about this transforming power of the Holy Spirit. So in Romans, in the Romans letter in particular, Romans 12 verse 1 and following uh, becomes the fourth therefore because Paul uses therefore three times before in order to point persons to some things. So the first therefore occurs in Romans 3 verse 20 where basically Paul is talking about this notion that the whole world is guilty before God, that, that it is the therefore of condemnation. Everyone has sinned and fallen short. Everyone has, has essentially not done what God requires. And so condemnation should fall on everyone, but it doesn't. Which brings us to the second therefore, which is Romans 5 verse 1, which is the therefore of justification. And Paul essentially makes this point, and, I, and I'm really just paraphrasing so that I'm keeping it simple so that we spend our time talking about the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.1, Paul begins this discussion about justification and the notion that we are justified by faith and not by works. We don't save ourselves. It is Christ who saves us. And it is our belief in Christ and in Christ's redeeming work that allows us to be saved so that all those, as Jesus says to his disciples and to those who hear him when he walked the earth, that all who call upon his name will be saved. They will be saved by the faith that they have in the name of Jesus Christ and his redeeming work. The third, therefore, is the, the therefore of assurance. Because we're justified by faith and because of Christ's redeeming work, we have this assurance that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. But if we take all of those things together, if we take all have fallen short and all have sinned, but it is belief in Jesus that brings us back into God, into a relationship with God, and we have this assurance that all those who believe, that everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ will be saved, that we, we then understand what that knowledge requires of us. And that brings us to the fourth, therefore, which we have in Romans 12, which is the therefore of dedication. Paul essentially is making an appeal, an appeal to us that we should dedicate ourselves to God. And we, we ought to ask ourselves, what is true dedication to God? And what is the role of the Holy Spirit in that process? Well, certainly the passage, in this passage in Romans 12 verse 1, Paul invites us to enter into a new relationship with God. He, he appeals to us to not take this relationship with God lightly. It's, we should note that it is not by our own strength that we're going to enter into this new relationship with God. Because in fact, he says it in his appeal. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who I absolutely love, uh, and his works are, are really, um, well, just a little bit as a sideline. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote several books. He is the person who is responsible for um, The Witch, the, Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, um, Chronicles of Narnia, all of those things. Uh, but he was really a profound theologian. And what is more important about him making all of these apologies for Christ and for God is that before he was an atheist, and, and we're talking about him writing these things in the 1940s and 50s, uh, but they still remain so relevant today. And in a piece of commentary on the same Romans passage, uh, he says, give up yourself. It's from mere Christianity, just 
to indicate the source. It says, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Paul's invitation is to give ourselves completely over to God. To throw ourselves on God's mercy. Accept that Jesus has already done everything. Accept what that mercy is, be, is able to bring about in our lives. And then give God everything. And when we give God everything, when we give God our body, then our body becomes an instrument of righteousness. It becomes a means for God's work to be done on the earth. Uh, of course, it's, it's why he then goes on to talk about the church being like members of the body and the fact that all of the members need each other. It's why he goes on to explain what he does about, about the way that we should treat with each other. And, and that's why in verse 3 he says that we should not think so highly of ourselves that we think less of others. But after we give God our body, we give ourselves to the work of God and to the things of God, we then have to give God our minds. God wants to transform and transfigure our minds. Uh, the, word, the word that is used for transform uh, is used elsewhere as transfigure in scripture. And if we think about what transfiguration is, what it was for Jesus, uh, I mean, it is to become the purest vision. Uh, the clearest vision of our true self. If we think about what transforming our minds means in the context of this conversation that we're having about the real power of the Holy Spirit, is it, it is to bring us up to our limits and to help us to be stretched beyond what we think we are. Uh, it's been a fascinating thing. To, and I won't call any names, but I think those persons who know them will, will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but in, in the context of some of our newly ordained folks, uh, the folks who, who knew them before they were involved in ministry in this kind of way um, would describe at least two of them as being shy and quiet and all of those things. And, and I have watched with amazement uh, what God's Holy Spirit has done for them because there's a boldness, there's a charisma, there, there's a, a sharing, there's a, a difference in the way that they now present themselves to the world. And we understand that it is not their own strength, but God using them for God's purpose that has brought about the change. And, um, and we really pray that God will just continue to fire them up in that way. And I'm deliberately using that example because there's so many occasions where persons say that they can't do this, I can't do that. I, I, how could, I mean, why would Father ask me to do that? Or, how could God expect me to do that? But, but it's not you, but God working through you. And if God has called you to some work, or called you to some activity, or called you to some purpose for him, then God will equip you with what you need. The Holy Spirit will lead you into the things that help you to be able to do what is necessary. Or God will provide someone who will assist you in the same way that God when Moses started complaining that he couldn't talk and he had a speech impediment and all of those kinds of things, God provided Aaron to help him. And really, Aaron was only a crutch for him because Moses was the one who eventually ended up speaking God's words. So we need to understand that that is the way that the Holy Spirit takes control of us and helps us to understand what is required. So we give God our bodies as a living sacrifice, and then we give God our minds. And when we give God our minds and that process of metamorphosis, that process of transformation begins, what it in fact does is it then brings us closer and closer to God's will. And we then have to submit ourselves to God's will. So body, 
mind and then will. And when we give God our wills, then that process becomes an interplay. Now, I'm sure that someone out there is asking, well, well, how do you do this? How do you give God your will? How do you give God your mind? And the best way that I could think about describing uh, this whole process is, is really like most of the other processes that we experience in life. Um, I mean, there, there's a, an old joke about how, how do you eat an elephant? One forkful at a time. How, how does the longest journey start with the first step? Uh, it is really about having that intention of will that you want to serve this Jesus just a little bit more. It is about having the intention of will uh, that you do want your body to belong to God. And, and the more that I thought about you know, how all of this works, there's a way in which Paul's appeal is really to some specific kinds of circumstances. Uh, and it's why later on he will talk about uh, we must be a new creation and, and the things that we did, we do them no more. Uh, because you really don't want to take your body, which is supposed to be God's temple, and misuse your body. Uh, you don't want to find yourself in situations where uh, ultimately uh, the things of the flesh have so much power over you uh, that you use your bodies in ways that you know that God would not approve of. So it is about seeing the body as a temple, as God's temple, as the temple of God's indwelling Holy Spirit, of treating with it in that way, treating it in wholesome ways, uh, so that it does become that instrument of righteousness, as we said before. But your mind, however, uh, and, well, one commentator put it this way, if you are not allowing your mind to be transformed, then it means that you're being conformed to the will, and you're being a conformer rather than a transformer. And we really want to accept what God is doing and allow our minds to truly be transformed. So one of the things that I think helps us to, to have our mind be transformed is the time that we spend with God's word. The word becomes a buffer. The things that Christ has said to his disciples about how we act, what we do. Uh, in, in the past couple of days, and in, in preparing when we would have had service last week or week before for Synod. Uh, one of the things that struck me, and I did share it, have the opportunity to share it, uh, was that, that Jesus said all of these things at different points in time, but he was really fairly consistent about them. So he told his disciples, for example, the world would, the world would hate them. That was one of the readings that we had for uh, two Saturdays ago. And one of the things that, that came to me in the midst of all of that was that he said that to them so that the other things that he said about being as wise as serpent, but as gentle as doves, turn in the other cheek and all of those things, um, that they would understand it, that they would be inoculated from what the world gives in order to do what God requires. And Paul's point is similar to that. Because Paul is, of course, trying to make sure that we ultimately allow ourselves to, to conform to God, be transformed by God and conform to the things of God rather than conforming to the things of the world. There is this real sense that our mind is transformed by seeking God's will through the power of the Holy Spirit and by feeding on God's will. Uh, disciplined prayer then helps us to put our will in God's hands. And so everything that we desire, everything that we pray for, everything that we bring to God, uh, somewhere in there we must be bold enough, brave enough to say, not my will, but thine, Lord. Uh, just as Jesus himself prays in dealing with the situations that he encounters. Of course, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit is a real thing. 
And we have to be prepared to embrace God in a way that brings our will in line with God's will. That brings our hopes and dreams, our desires, all that we are, in line with what God wants. Paul, Paul is appealing to the folks in Rome, appealing to those who will hear his letter read. Uh, and, and really, I mean, of course, we know that most of the letters are composite letters, that they're bits of letters written at different points in time, but put together. But what makes them unique is, of course, the situations for which they were written. And in Rome, one of the things, of course, is that you have Romans and you have Jews, and folks, they're not always getting along. Some folks think that they're better than others. Some folks think that they have already arrived. Uh, Paul is trying to help everybody be humble and submit to God. Paul is trying to help everyone come to this knowledge that that if they submit themselves to God, body, mind, and spirit, that their wills will eventually conform to God's purposes. He doesn't pretend that that is an easy thing. He himself struggles. He, he talks about the thorn in his flesh, and he talks about other kinds of things which, which have made this process difficult. He talks about factions and, and, and unity. And he, of course, gives this notion that it is in seeking Christ, the things of Christ, and seeking to fulfill what Christ has commanded, that we will eventually come to the things that are required. Of course, the promise is, and it is not Paul's promise, or Father Richard's promise, or, or the bishop's promise, the promise is that God will not leave us helpless. But the Holy Spirit, the transforming Holy Spirit of God, will be with us to guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit, therefore, serves as, as in many ways, the energizing force of all that we are meant to seek and be and do. And so I really want to pray that we will will make ourselves open to that process that we will understand the transforming power of the holy spirit to move our lives from where we are to where god wants us to be to to fill up the gaps that we have and allow us to become more like this christ whom we are following and seeking that we will understand that it is not our power not our strength not anything that we possess of ourselves that will bring these things to being into being but god's mercy active through god's holy spirit present in god's will that leads us to the risen christ and that we will commit ourselves to that work commit ourselves daily to allowing god to use our bodies as an instrument of his purpose commit our minds the transforming power of God so that, that the world will see that there is something different about us that we don't just fit in to everything that the world is giving and that we will bring our wills to God so that our wills will ultimately become the expression of God's will active in our lives I pray that, that this has been helpful for you I pray that we will all commit ourselves to living and abiding under that grace that Christ gives so that the Spirit will continue to guide us into God's truth. The Lord be with you.